what was the key going for at that time? Uh, it was about twenty six thousand pounds, so about thirty thousand, about thirty thousand dollars, I suppose, something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, give or take a thousand or two, depending on how much was around, you know. So, so you were retailing them for about about thirty US. Yeah, yeah. I how, mean, how much were you? How much what was your your price? I mean, if I was just flipping a kilo, I I would just put a thousand or two thousand on it. Depended who it was going to. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, some people I would charge more, others less. Um, but on a kilo average was because it was just quick turnover. It would be like a, a grand, two grand. Some sometimes it would be three or four. You know, if, if I was depending lucky. on who it was. Sorry. Depending on who it was. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um. So the amounts are getting bigger. Um, yeah, so like I was saying, the, the, the dealer back in Stroud started to get cold feet at this point. He was like, well, you know, the, he was used to dealing grams and ounces and stuff like that. Suddenly I'm coming back and asking for half a kilo, a kilo. He was like, well, I'm, you know, I don't want to be involved in this amount. Uh, so he offered to introduce me to his supplier, who was a guy up near Oxford. He was getting, his, getting the coke direct from London, from the people that were importing it into the country. Um, so I went and met him, got on really well. He was a musician, quite a bit older than me, quite a well-known musician. He'd had a couple of top 10 hits in this, in the seventies. Um, he used to hang about with members of the who, uh, the band, the who. So, you know, top level musician. Shit. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, well, yeah, I won't mention any specific names, but you know, you get the idea. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so start traveling out to London with this guy and start meeting his, his people who were the people that are bringing it into the country. And I, I, I mean, I knew they were, t- that, that they were high level, but it was only recently that I really did really just sort of did some digging into their background. Cause you know, at the time you don't want to know where it's coming from, really. Do you? you don't, there's questions you don't ask and that's one of them. <laughs> right. Plausible denial. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. So it's like, I, I don't care where it's coming I, from. I don't know. It's good quality. It's cheap. That's all good. I don't, I don't care where it's from. I don't know. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> but anyway, it was coming from, these guys were important from the Medellin cartel. Uh, mm-hmm. It was like the tail end of Pablo Escobar's cartel. He was dead by this mm-hmm. point, but the mm-hmm. cartel was still operating. Mm-hmm. And what they were doing was they were, they were chartering uh, sailing boats, yachts, sailing over to the Caribbean, northern Colombia, like Cartagena, Santa Marta. And they were loading up with like a ton, ton and a half of cocaine, sailing it back through the Caribbean, back to Britain. And they were doing what's uh, called coopering. So they would offload the cocaine onto fishing boats that had come out from local ports, uh, from Ireland, Southern Ireland, from Kerry, Cork. Um, or sometimes they would just sail it straight into Southampton, Portsmouth, where they would offload. Hence the fact that the Coke was so good and uh, unbeatable price because they were pretty much running the cocaine market in, in southern Britain at that time. Um, you know, so I'd gone very... And this has all happened within a space of, I don't know, six, six months to a year, if that. Mm. So mm. I've gone from that 14 grams to that student up to bringing back three, four keys of, uh, of Coke, sometimes more, you know, a week from London, back down to Wales, back to my home area, to Bristol. You know, so the amounts, it, you know, became much larger. The amounts of hashish that I was getting asked for were getting a lot bigger. Uh, there was one particular guy in South Wales who was asking for between 500 kilos and a ton every every 10 days to two weeks. Of hash? Yeah, of hashish, like a transit van what, full. What was, what, was, uh, what was that going for? What was like, a, oh, what that were was, the denominations of hash? I, like, did it come in, it came in kilos? I, like, like No, coke? at the time it was, well, it depended because we had various sources for the hash. So it depended. We were getting nine bars. So there were four, quart, like, they looked like soap bar. So four bars to a kilo. That was some of it. That was like the standard hash at the time. It's what they called soap bar because it looked like a bar of soap. Uh, four to a kilo. Uh, we would get uh, squidgy black, like Pakistani hashish, Afghani pollen, uh, Moroccan pollen. We'd get Thai, Thai weed. 
um, uh, we'd get Indian Charis, uh, Nepalese, all sorts of stuff coming in, depending on what was around. Um, also, depended on, you know, obviously in Nepalese and stuff like that, we, you know, you, you don't get as much volume of that. It was, that was like 100 keys if you were lucky. Um, but a lot what was of that. Had, what, what was that? Nepalese, Nepalese temple ball. Well, it's like charis, what they call charis is like Indian hashish that's hand rolled uh. into sticks and patties, like round uh. disc, really good, very high quality hash. Beautiful smell. That, that's how it used to be when, when I was a kid. Um, yeah. Well, a young a young person out there in the in the eighties and yeah. the early eighties, and we yeah, um, we were getting hash, you know, for our just because we smoked weed. We sold yeah. heroin, yeah, yeah, you know, but we smoked weed and having hash, yeah. and your weed was like, you know, the weed <laughs> wasn't as strong back then, right? Yeah, no, you know? it wasn't was it at all, right? So yeah, that that's how it used to be, rolled like that or patty, yeah, yeah, yeah. dark, yeah, 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 dark, yeah, exactly, squidgy, yeah. Um, so. How did you catch your, catch your second case? Yeah, so all of this is going on uh, when I'm at university. Uh, the, by this point, people had, quite a few people had started dying around me. So when I was 14, my best friend died, dropped dead of a, a brain hemorrhage in the village that I was living in the evening. Just had a game of tennis. He went home, dropped dead in the shower. And from that point on, people just started dying around me. In fact, I got nicknamed... Uh, uh, Grim Peter, like the Grim Reaper, Grim Peter, because that honestly, I, I shit you not, that many people have died around me is like insanity. So yeah, well, um, I was going to tell you that when I get back out there, I'm going to come kick it with you. But um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so yeah, so all the, so like I said, so, so like first one at fourteen, uh, and then when I was at uh, sixth form college, a girlfriend got killed in a car accident, then another friend in the same month. By the time I was 20, I'd seen eight people die in front of me from overdoses, heart attacks, car accidents that I'd just come across, bike accident. Actually, actually take their last breath, I'd watch die, you know. That's not, that's not normal. Well, not, no. for, not for England anyway. No. Um, no. So there I was mean... a lot of trauma built. This is where the trauma starts coming. So there's a lot of trauma building up, all the alcoholism with my mum's going on. You know, she's now been... Uh, committed to psych wards a few times mm. you know it's all really stressful um, that the, 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 that death of my girlfriend or the, the girl that I was very really keen on when I was at six home college that really did that, that you know affected me quite a lot so mm. anyway at the se- in the second year at uni with all the drug dealing which which to some extent was a form of escapism I think mm-hmm, you know mm-hmm. I definitely got off on the adrenaline of it all, the excitement and the whole lifestyle. But a big part of it, I think, was the the escapism of, of drug dealing, using drugs, not massively using, but using some. So anyway, drop out of uni in the second year, uh, which I regret, and left. Uh, moved from Cardiff to Bristol, which I said is nearby, in the, again, in the southwest of England. Uh, at the time, my girlfriend was living there. So rented a house, moved in with her. Again, started meeting some bigger people in Bristol, started supplying them. Got some new connections up in London with some other people for more cocaine. Uh, oddly enough, I didn't know it at the time, but the Colombian that I later become partners with, that I did the international thing with, was actually supplying one of the people I got introduced to when I was living in Bristol. Turned out it was the same Colombian. Weird coincidences wow. in my life. <laughs> Just, wow. Yeah, very weird. Um, so, yeah. Just keep expanding the business, expand into Scotland, start selling to someone up in Edinburgh. Uh, you know, just trying to expand it as much as possible. Things come to a crushing halt. Uh Started to have a lot of trouble in Bristol with people not paying. Uh, I ended up getting together with the, the ex-girlfriend of a yardy gangster type in Bristol, <laughs> which he mm. didn't like. Um, so I, you know, there were car chases. They tried to kill me. I tried to kill them. <laughs> you know, the usual. <laughs> so I, I decided to move out of Bristol, take the girl with me and her daughter and uh, move back up to Stroud. Um, and... 
things went on normal for a bit when I was living in Stroud. And then in May of 2000, it was actually the day after her birthday, um, we'd had a bit of a party. And I went off to deliver three ounces of cocaine to somebody. And uh, unbeknown to me, the house was under surveillance, the, you know, where my friend was living. So I turn up there in a big red transit van, you know, a big van. Mm -hmm. Couldn't miss me. <laughs> so I turn up there in this huge red van, uh, go, and go in, you know, have a chat, do a few lines and uh, give him the coke and uh, leave the house, get in the van. And I, I had the drugs in the briefcase, like a laptop uh, combination briefcase thing. Anyway, get in the van, drive about seven miles up the road towards a town called Chel Cheltenham, as you would pronounce it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've been to Cheltenham. You beat the Cheltenham? Mm -hmm. Shut up. Yeah. Man. That's literally like yeah. seven, I don't know, 10 miles from where I live. But that's, that's crazy. 10 miles from Stroud. What, Cheltenham, Cheltenham in the UK you've been to? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Really? Yeah. <laughs> no way. Where you watching? The race course? I get around. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So, headed towards Cheltenham that you've been to, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, get about seven miles up the road, and I get this marked police car come screaming up behind me, blue lights come on, and I thought, initially, I thought, oh, it's a, it's a routine traffic stop. I thought I could probably get away with this. I've done it before. You know, be stopped, give, just bullshit my way out of it. Mm -hmm. Anyway, they, they pulled me over, get out of the van. And straight away, it's apparent, it's obvious, it's not a routine stop. They know there's drugs in the van. So they went straight for the briefcase, got it out, crowbarred it open. Obviously, I get arrested. They find drugs in the briefcase. And... Uh, like I say, the house had been under surveillance by the police, local police, local drug squad. Mm -hmm. And as I left and drove off, they raided the house. The guy in the house managed to get most of the coke down the toilet. But they found traces of cocaine around the rim, of the, like the toilet bowl. The bag, scales, money, you know, usual paraphernalia. So mm -hmm. they... Arrest him. Y'all using well, y'all y'all weren't using triple beams by then, right? Because this is Is it what? Trip the triple beam scales. Oh what the old uh, balances. Mm -hmm. No, mm -hmm. no, this is digitals. Digital, digital, right? Yeah. yeah. I did used to use those old balance ones when I first oh, started yeah? out for the hashish, yeah, yeah. <laughs> using like because <laughs> in England a, a penny, a one pence piece is three and three point five grams, like an eight. Right. Yeah. Uh yep. and a two P is seven grams, a quarter of an ounce. And a, and a, any dollar bill, it, well, you know, USD is a gram. Uh, was a gram. Yeah, 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 yeah. I saw that in Ecuador. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um. So what was that? Oh yeah. So he gets arrested. Mm -hmm. Obviously, at that point, they they've come off at, at you know up the road after me. Uh, I get arrested. Uh, the guy in the house got bail because they didn't find a particularly large amount of drugs. They just found traces and paraphernalia. So he gets bail. But I get arrested. I get taken to, to the police station in Cheltenham. They find a sawn-off shotgun in the back of the van, broken into bits, uh, you know, because I knew if I got caught, it was better to be broken down into bits than, than ready to go. So uh, anyway, they find that. Uh, didn't want to tell them where I lived, obviously, because I knew there were more drugs in the house. Uh, by this point, I'm renting a, a wing of a manor house in a, in a village called Slad. Uh, if anybody's read the book uh, Cider with Rosie by Laurie Lee, uh, the house is mentioned in that book. It's called Steambridge Court. Mm. Um, beautiful place, amazing place, beautiful village, um, idyllic setting, you know, a big lake in the garden. Amazing beautiful. place, lovely, just beautiful. Beautiful. Uh, but in the middle of nowhere, you know, no telephone reception there, which I, I purposely look for so I couldn't be uh, tracked by the police. So anyway, it takes him a while to find this place because I don't want to tell him where I'm living because I know there's more drugs at home. And I'm hoping that my girlfriend, who's still at home, would have thought, oh, he hasn't come back for a day or two by now. Maybe I should maybe have a clean up. But she doesn't think. And uh, sure enough, the police get there. They find all the drugs. And uh, yeah, I get arrested with all that, that list of drugs that you gave earlier. 